There is nothing worth living for unless it is worth dying for. My grandmother lived a life devoted to Jesus, and today her talks have been made available in their original form. So you too can be built up through the insights and mysteries God revealed to her throughout her ministry. Now, without further ado, here is Elizabeth Elliot. Second talk is entitled A Loving Providence. Do you know what a providence is? It's a word we, we use, I guess, probably not very often, but it's it, it it covers a great many things. It means a making provision. We ought to be able to remember that one since it comes from the same root word. Providence, making provision, exercising forethought, preparing. Guiding, caring. A simple illustration would be your own providence with your children. You make provision for them, you exercise forethought, you prepare things, you guide them, you care for them. Someone has said the detailed providence of a rational, personal God. That is the thing that I find so staggering. In my old age, I've been reading over some of my journals. I'm now working on volume 30 of the journals that I began in, in when I was 16 years old. And they're not, that, that's not going to help you with how much is in which years were in which book, because I just use blank books and I fill up a blank book and then I go to the next one, but I'm now in my 30th blank book. And I hadn't read back over much of anything, but occasionally I pull one out of the trunk in the attic and I, I read a little bit, and the thing that stands out to me, in addition to my own stupidity and failures and all of that, which is egregious, but the thing that God reminds me of is his unfailing faithfulness and providence. What a story of the faithfulness of God over against the unfaithfulness of one woman. The detailed providence of a rational, personal God. I see that. When Jim Elliot was praying whether God wanted him to go to Ecuador, uh, he had been corresponding with a missionary who was in the jungle there, and he had made it known to his uh, friends in the assembly, of which he was a member, that he believed that God was calling him to be a missionary, and specifically to be a missionary in Ecuador. Would they please pray for him? And they did. And he was invited to go around speaking occasionally to different assemblies. And they would sometimes press a $10 bill or a $5 bill, bill into his hand just as they were shaking hands goodbye at the door. And each time he was given a gift, he would stuff it into his pocket. And when he got home, he put it into an envelope without really looking at it. When he finally believed that he had to make a move and start moving in the direction of Ecuador, he went down, he took that envelope out of his drawer and he went down to the place where you buy tickets for liners in those days. They were going, he was going by boat to Ecuador. And so he went down to book a passage on a freighter and the man told him the dates on when different freighters would be going, etc., cetera, etc. Cetera. And when they got all through, Jim said, "Okay, how much is the tickets going to cost?" The man said, three hundred and fifteen dollars." And Jim pulled out the envelope, and you guessed it. He had three hundred and fifteen dollars and sixty cents. The detailed providence of a rational, personal God. Can we think of having a contest of wills with that kind of God? Why would we? Well, because we're prideful, we are presumptive, and we are unbelieving. And that's the long and the short of it, isn't it? That's the truth. That's the only reason that we would ever question the wisdom and the providence of God. The eternal God is thy refuge, and underneath are the everlasting arms. 
May I see the hands of those of you who might have heard me say that on a program called Gateway to Joy? Oh, I'm delighted to see that there are some listeners to that program. George MacDonald said, I believe in the providence, but not in the specialty. We're always hearing people talk about special providences. Oh, that was a special providence that last night when we had a flat on the highway in the sleet and the snow, we were within a maybe 500 or 1,000 feet of the, ticket, of the toll booth, which meant that there were blazing lights. And so when our driver pulled over to the side, if we had been in the dark, it would have been very dangerous for one thing because cars might have hit us. We also might have slid into the ditch as a number of cars had already done as we drove from Chicago. But this happened, the flat tire happened as we were approaching the toll booth. And there were big semi trucks to our left, and so there was room on the right to change the tire with plenty of light. I believe, George MacDonald says, in the providence, but not in the specialty. I do not believe that God lets the thread of my affairs go for six days and on the seventh evening takes it up for a moment. The so-called special providence providences are no exception to the rule. They are common to all men at all moments. But God's care is more evident in some instances of it than in others to the dim and bewildered vision of humanity. Men seize and call them providences. It would be gloriously better if they could believe that the whole matter is one grand providence. I believe that. The whole matter is one grand providence. God has never let anything slip through his fingers. He has never made a mistake. And I look back through my journals and I realize he has never broken a promise. He certainly has not done things the way I expected. When I have an opportunity to talk with young people who are considering the mission field or people that are planning to go out for perhaps a short term in the summertime, they come to me and ask, do you have any advice? Well, I have. I tell them, number one, don't even think of going to the mission field for even a short term unless you're prepared to be a servant. And how can you know if you are prepared to be a servant? Well, there's a very simple way to find out. Note your reaction when somebody treats you like one. If anybody actually treats you like a servant, most of us rise up in fury. Well, imagine what she said to me, or what she did to me, or imagine what I did for this church group and nobody ever said thank you. Is that a servant heart? A servant is totally at the disposal of his master. We are totally disposable. These providences, it would be gloriously better if we could believe that the whole matter is one grand providence. And then I say to these prospective missionaries, I believe that the will of God is infinitely bigger than you and I can imagine. The will of God is going to be much harder than you thought. The will of God is going to be very different from what you imagine it's going to be. It certainly was in my case and in the case of every missionary, every veteran missionary that I've ever talked with. The will of God is very different from what we imagine. But, and I don't leave them in that swamp of despair, it is going to be infinitely more glorious than you can ever imagine. And I'm here to testify that that is the truth. I don't suppose there's anybody here old enough to have listened to Catherine Kuhlman, who was on the radio years ago, and I love to listen to her. And one of the things that she used to interject in almost every talk was, and how many know that's the truth? Put up a hand. How many know that's the truth? Put up a hand. And she had a voice much deeper than mine. She was wonderful. And she'd say, um, what was the other, oh, it was another one, it just slipped my mind. I love to hear her say, oh yes, people would ask her, do you believe in a second blessing? 
And she would say, yes, I believe in a second blessing. I believe in a third and a fourth and a fiftieth blessing. It's just more of Jesus. <laughs> what a woman she was with what discipline. More of Jesus. The whole matter is one grand providence. Yes, yes, yes. I am here to testify. He is loving. He is wise. He fully understands his children. And there are no two of us in this room alike. We don't look alike. We don't think alike. We don't act alike. God fully understands your background, all the hindrances, all the sorrows, all the uh, so-called disasters that happened in your life that made it impossible for you to be the kind of a person that you think you would like to be. He knows all those. He's not taken by surprise. He was not taken by surprise by a flat tire yesterday. Do you believe that? Do you trust him? He says, will you love me? Will you trust me? Will you praise me? Okay, three points for you note takers. Number one, his power and his love. The heading is a loving providence. And remember, all of these are under keep a quiet heart. The reason I can keep a quiet heart is because I know that there is a loving providence. Absolutely in control of the airlines and everything else. So his power and his love. Think of the miracle that God did for the children of Israel when they got to the Red Sea. And the sea divided itself for Israel. Does water ever do that by itself? I mean, God has ordained that water goes wherever water can go. And if you have a leaking roof, the water is going to come through the roof because that's where the water wants to go. But there are times when God intervenes and changes the course of nature for the sake of his people. And so the water stood up, the Bible says, like walls. Can you imagine that? And the people of Israel went through without even wetting their feet. But what happened when the Egyptians tried to follow them? Nature took its course again because a loving providence had intervened to do something very special and very unexpected for the children of Israel. But he's in charge of the whole thing. He was in charge when the water came back down again, wasn't he? When Shadrach, Meshach, and Abednego were challenged by the king, and they said, the king said, do you believe that your God whom you serve can deliver you from this fiery furnace? And I love their reply. Yes. We believe that our God, whom we serve, can deliver us from this fiery furnace. But if not, be it known to you, O king, that we will not bow down to the image nor serve you. No matter what God does, we will trust him. We are going to trust him. So what happens? Well, Shadrach, Meshach, and Abednego are indeed thrown into the fiery furnace, just as the king had taunted them about. And it was heated so hot that the men who threw them in were singed and burned to death. The fire consumed the king's strongest soldiers, as fire will do. Fire will always eat anything that fire has a chance to eat. But it didn't eat Shadrach, Meshach, and Abednego. That's certainly what we would call a special providence, wasn't it? God didn't call, call it special. It was his action, which he knew from before the foundation of the world, and he preserved them. And those hungry lions, what is the nature of lions? Well, to eat meat. And so when Daniel was thrown into the lion's den, it certainly was the nature of those lions to go for him. And can you imagine what must have gone through, through Daniel's head when he was told that he was going to be thrown into the lion's den? He had a lot of time, I would think, at least hours, to ponder where does it lion start? On your face, maybe? Where does he take the first bite? I mean, I, if I had been in Daniel's shoes, I'm sure that's what I would have been imagining, all sorts of things. And it certainly is their nature to devour meat. But they 
hungry as they were, did not take one single bite out of Daniel. Well, I had here in my notes when I prepared these several weeks ago to tell you about a trip to the airport in January of 1996. I don't need to bother telling you about a trip to the airport <laughs> in 1997. But God did control what nobody else could control in that particular case. We couldn't have possibly gotten to the airport with the blizzard, kind of blizzard we had, but we got there. And when we got there, I fully expected that our flight to Miami would be canceled. And it was the only flight on the whole screen that was not canceled. And so the Lord is one who is concerned about the tiniest and the biggest things in our lives. And he is the same Lord who spoke and the wind and the waves were calm. He can speak a word, and he speaks peace to our soul when we simmer down and conform our wills to him. My brother Phil experienced peace, joy, fun when he finally drank his milk. Such a ridiculously small thing, isn't it? And yet, if we don't see God in those things, how are we ever going to see him? in what to us are the big things. Secondly, his tenderness. First thing was his power and his love. Second is his tenderness. Psalm 23, the Lord is my shepherd. I heard about a little girl who was taught to say that. The Lord is my shepherd. And so she said the words, taking hold of, four fingers, and then clasping her thumb with the word shepherd. And that little girl became very ill, and she died. And when they found her, she was holding her hand, her thumb. She'd been saying those words, the Lord is my shepherd. And he leadeth me in paths of righteousness for whose namesake? Elizabeth Elliot's? No. For his namesake, he leads us in green pastures beside still waters, and he also leads us where? Through the dark valley. But the psalmist says, Yea, though I walk through the valley of the shadow of death, I will fear no evil. Does he fear no evil because there isn't any? No. There's a lot of evil. The world is full of evil. But he says, I will fear no evil, for thou art with me. That's all that matters. It simplifies your life. It will give you a quiet heart. The Lord is with you. He is not going to allow anything at all to take place without his control. Every night when we children went to bed, we were sung with by one or the other of our parents. Jesus, tender shepherd, hear me. Bless thy little lamb tonight. Through the darkness be thou near me. Keep me safe till morning light. Very reassuring, comforting words that had a quieting effect on all of us. What we consider marvelous coincidences meet and unite and bring about the good of God's chosen people. In January, January of 1996, in that trip that I just mentioned. We were going to Ecuador for the second time. We had gone in 1994, and my husband and I decided that we would like to go and take Valerie, my daughter, and her husband, and her oldest grandson, her oldest son, my, our oldest grandson. Well, we had to make a trip from Quito down into the jungle in order to visit the Quechua Indians and then the Aucas, and I didn't know how we were going to get there but who, who should happen to be at the guest house where we were staying but Nate Saint's son, Steve. And he just happened to be going to the jungle the next day, which was the day we were hoping to go. And he just happened to say that he'd be glad to take us. And so we got to Tana, which used to be a very tiny little crossroads when I was a missionary. And this was where I was hoping that we would be able to find my dear friend Venancio, the, the faithful Quechua Indian who had taken over on the station when Jim died. 
And Venancio has always followed the Lord very faithfully. He's learned the Alca language now. He's a missionary not only to the Quechuas, but to the Alcas as well. And I had been corresponding with him, telling him about our arrival and hoping that he would be able to round up a few of the people that I was most longing to see. So when we got to Tena, my heart sank to discover that Tena is now a metropolis. And I didn't have any idea how we were going to find Venancio. Back in my day, you could have asked anybody on the street, where does Venancio live? And they would have known. But everything just seemed to cave in on me immediately before I'd even gotten out of the car. I just thought, we're never going to be able to find this man. What are we going to do? I got out of the car since I'm the only one, I was the only one other than Steve who spoke Spanish, and I was the only one who spoke Quechua. So I got out of the car and Instantly, a young man came up to me and he said, Buenos dias, senora, which, of course, you understand in Spanish. Good morning, senora. And I said, Buenos dias, Runashimiri Makchangi, which means, are you a speaker of Quechua? And he said, yes. And he was almost, almost dropped his teeth right there you know, to see this old foreign woman uh, speaking his language. And I said, do you know where Venancio lives? And he says, yes, I can take you there. the tenderness of a shepherd who leads us in paths of righteousness for his namesake. The great why that comes up in our minds. Why does God allow this? Why doesn't God do that? Psalm 85, verses 7 and 8. Show us your unfailing love, O Lord, and grant us your salvation. I will listen to what God the Lord will say. He promises peace to his people, his saints. I will listen. And lastly, is he trustworthy? Can you bring yourself to believe that God is trustworthy? Psalm Proverbs 16, 4 says, The Lord works out everything for his own ends. The Lord works out everything for his own ends. It is a loving providence. He is love. God so loved the world. But we say to ourselves, well, I trust him most of the time, but how can I call things which hurt or disappoint me blessings? From a loving God? Yes. We need to revise our understanding of the word love. You mothers, when you have spanked your little child, did you ever say what my mother would say to us? This hurts me worse than it hurts you? And did you ever believe that when you were a little child? Of course not. I didn't believe a word of it. I believe it now. You spank the child because you love the child. And my dear friend, Barb Tompkins of Tucson, Arizona, told me that she raised her children on the principle that happiness is a choice. And if you choose to disobey, you are choosing a spanking. And so when little Katie disobeyed, Barb called her to come over, took her onto her lap, and said, Katie, I see that you have chosen a spanking. Whereupon she administered the spanking, and then she tells Katie how much she loves her. And of course, Katie doesn't believe a word of that either. But the time comes when she knows it's true. And we are equally faithless with God. Is he trustworthy? Does he really know what he's doing? Do these things come from a loving God? Hebrews 10.35, do not throw away your confidence. It will be richly rewarded. You have need to persevere so that when you have done the will of God, you will receive what he has promised. Teach your child perseverance. Do not throw away your confidence. I can remember being at my daughter's house when she was trying to teach her eight-year-old daughter, Christiana, arithmetic. And Christiana was just wailing at the kitchen table where they have homeschooling. And she said, oh, Mama, I can't do this, and I'm never going to be able to do this. She had thrown away her confidence, which is exactly what I did when it came to arithmetic. <laughs> Teach perseverance. In sixth grade, we had a 
penmanship teacher who made us write little jingles by way of practice in penmanship. And one of them was, if a task is once begun, never leave it till it's done. Be the labor great or small, do it well or not at all. Now you ought to be able to remember that just hearing it once. If a task is once begun, never leave it till it's done. Be the labor great or small, do it well or not at all. Will you say to the Lord, I am willing to receive what you send, to lack what you withhold, to relinquish what you take, to suffer what you inflict, and to do what you command, and to be what you require. Now, I know some of you wish that I had said that slowly enough so you could write it all down. Some of you already know it. It's not original with me, but I will give it to you again in a form which is quick. Just put, I am willing, at the top, then put, receive, and then space, send. I'm willing to receive what you send. Under receive, put lack. And under send, put withhold. I'm willing to relax what, to lack what you withhold. Under lack, put relinquish. Under withhold, put take. Under relinquish, put suffer. And under take, put inflict. And then to do what you command and to be what you require. A loving providence, his power and love, his tenderness, his trustworthiness. You will keep a quiet heart if you trust him. God bless you. Last night you shared that Jim Elliott was a wrestler, a campus clown, and yet a spiritual leader. Now, how do we as parents direct and keep that perspective to train our kids to love God and yet have fun along the way? I don't think you need to spend five minutes training your children to have fun. <laughs> train your children to love God. Do things with them, of course, as a family. It ought to be fun. It ought to be delightful to go to the beach together, to do things as a family, but I don't think you need to train them to have fun. Sports are such a god in America. Yes, I couldn't agree more. It's, it's just become a god. The sitting around watching TV and little kids having to go to Little League and things like that, I, I think it's a very heavy burden that parents are putting on them. What was the name of the first Amy Carmichael book you read at age 14? I really don't know. Um, it might have been If. I would strongly urge you to get some of her books, and If is the thinnest of the books, but not by any means the easiest. It's the one that's going to hit you right between the eyes on every page. You're not going to like it, but it's wonderful. I would like to start my 12-year-old on reading her books. Are there any other that would interest her? Uh, yes, I think Mimosa would be a very appropriate one. It's a lovely story of an Indian girl and how for years and years she had no spiritual help, but her trust remained strong. Um, I believe, I don't know if that's one of the ones that Lars has, but you can still get it. Recently on the radio I heard you say, poor self-esteem is a form of pride and a sin against God. Could you restate that for me? Yes, poor self-esteem. <laughs> is a form of pride and a sin against God. That really isn't exactly the way I should state it, because what I mean is that if we have poor self-esteem, the only reason it's poor is because it doesn't measure up to our idea of what we think other people ought to see in us. I always want to ask when people talk about, well, I'm working on my self-esteem, whose estimate of your self-esteem are you talking about? Whose estimate of yourself? Is it what you think other people think you are? Is it what you think you are? Or is it what God knows you are? Now, as soon as you take the position that Isaiah and Peter took, your self-esteem is going to plummet 
down to zero. Because remember, when Isaiah saw the holiness of God, he said, Woe is me, for I am a man of unclean lips. And Peter said, Depart from me, for I am a sinful man. Where is self-esteem? Self-esteem there is a very accurate picture of a helpless, hopeless sinner. And that's all any of us is. What do you read? Could you recommend books for all ages? Well, I happen to be reading a wonderful book about Robert E. Lee right now. I got it out of the library just before we came on this trip, and I read about half of it yesterday. <laughs> and it is Douglas Southall. I think the last name is Freeman, but I'm not really sure. Anyway, there's about, you're probably, if you go to your library, there'll be about 10 books, biographies of Robert E. Lee, but the first and middle names are Douglas Southall. I'm sure about that. Boys would love it, any boys that are interested in battle and all that. Um, I read mostly spiritual books. I really, I have very, very little time for reading. Flying is the one redeeming feature of flying, of which we do a lot, is to be able to sit down and read a book. And the phone isn't going to ring, and nobody's going to interrupt me. So that's when I try to get my books read. I read a lot of old books. My father always taught us read two old books before you read one new one. Well, at my age, life is much too short for me to read the new ones. So I just read old books, mostly out of print books. If you get my newsletter, you get a lot of quotations from out of print books. If you listen to Gateway to Joy, you hear me talk about out of print books. So I can't help you with where to find them because you have to go to a secondhand store. There are some very fine books which I have been deeply taught through. Amy Carmichael, George MacDonald, anything at all that you can get your hands on by George MacDonald, and there are many, many of his books in print. C.S. Lewis, his books are in print. Those are three at the top of the list. Would you please comment on women's clothing and dress? Thank you. I want to beg all of you women, let's go back to femininity. Can we aim at that which is most distinctly feminine? I don't want you to think that I'm against the wearing of pants, but it's not distinctly feminine. There are occasions when pants are appropriate. If you're riding a horse, if you're digging in the garden, if you're walking in sub-zero weather, uh, you wear slacks, and I don't think there's anything sinful about that. But I do want to see more women willing to be as feminine as possible. And that means, for one thing, modesty. You don't wear tight-fitting clothes. You don't wear really short skirts. And you don't try to draw attention to yourself by always being the one in the vanguard of fashion. I don't think we're supposed to look frumpy. Obviously, I'm not dressed the way I suppose Mary and Martha were dressed. That was their culture. This is our culture. But I don't want to wear flashy things, flamboyant things, which are going to draw attention. Those are just a few small, tiny suggestions, but ask the Lord what most honors him, and by all means, be extremely careful if you ever go to the beach. God help the poor men. <laughs> Is there no case for divorce? speak to physically mental abuse, drug abuse, or possibly mental illness. There is no case for divorce for those reasons. The only exception, and I'm not even sure it's an exception, so I don't want to be quoted as saying that it is, but it looks to me as though unfaithfulness, adultery, is perhaps the one and only exception that Jesus seems to have made. I can't go beyond that. Please respond to pick up thy cross and follow me, include defining the cross. The definition of the cross is small duties, the acceptance of small duties which are distasteful to us. That would be a very basic definition of the cross, not some great heroic martyrdom, but the taking up of the cross. Jesus said we are to take up our cross daily. For me, I will expose myself to you. 
I find it difficult every day to treat my husband the way I want to treat Jesus Christ. That's difficult, but I know that that is exactly what God wants me to do. Matthew 25, 40 says, Inasmuch as you have done it unto one of the least of these my brothers, and Lars is not the least, so certainly if I'm to do it for the least, I'm to do it also for him. You've done it for me, Jesus said. The way we treat other people, whether it's a husband, whether it's an impossible boss that you have at work, whether it's a nasty neighbor, whether it's a woman at the church who gossips about you and perhaps lies about you, perhaps somebody in your family, uh, your in-laws or your grandparents or something, somebody that you just have a terrible time with acceptance of the cross is going to show you what to do. The continual daily J. Adams with regard to divorce, but it's out of print, but J. Adams has written a book called Marriage, Divorce, and Remarriage. So if you can find that in a second-hand bookstore or a church library, you might find some help there. The taking up of the cross is the continual daily acceptance of small duties which are distasteful to us. Things which cut across our preferences. I agree with your comments about self-esteem. If we're so absorbed in ourselves, we're not looking to the Lord. However, Dr. James Dobson is big into self-esteem and would disagree with you. What would you tell him? Actually, I think Dr. Dobson and I are pretty much on the same wavelength on almost everything else. Um, I don't think we've ever had a conversation about that. But I do disagree just with the term that he talks about, building your child's self-esteem. Uh, I think that that's a misnomer. We are to build our child's strength of will, and we are to show the child that this is selfishness, whatever this action is. As this amazing lady that was the headmistress of the school that I went to when I was in high school, she said to me, when I had only been in that school about two weeks and I was 14 years old and terrified of her, as was everybody else, she called me into the office and she said, Betty Howard, you are self-conscious and the only reason you are self-conscious is because you are selfish. It is pure selfishness. And you're going to get over that, or we will help you pack your bags, and we will give you a, a free ride down to the train station. We don't need you in this school. Well, I got some tough stuff. <laughs> Knowing how you feel about the self-esteem issue, I wonder if you could provide some balance for those who struggle with feeling loved and valued. I wonder if this person means who struggle with feeling unloved. I mean, I can't imagine anybody struggling with feeling loved. A friend of mine grew up with parents who made it clear that they didn't really want her and carries a lot of anger because of this. That's an old story. It's not new. We need to remember that all of this was dealt with on the cross of Jesus Christ. This whole thing about child abuse, a lot of people think it's a new thing. Perhaps it's more prevalent, but so what? God deals with individuals. So all of these things which become catchwords in the public imagination, they were dealt with. The Bible says, He hath borne our griefs and carried our sorrows. And Paul says, forgetting those things which are behind and reaching forth to those things which are before, I press toward the mark for the prize of the high calling of God in Christ Jesus. Forget about yourself. Ask God to enable you to fulfill Isaiah 58.10. Start pouring yourself out for other people. You'll forget about your self-esteem. You'll forget about your past and all the reasons why you feel so terrible and all the terrible things that people have done. There's nothing new about it. What guidelines would you suggest when a prayer-determined, ordered day, like meals at 8, 12, and 6, are interrupted by needs or requests of others? I appreciate that question, because of course we must never be so determined that we have to carry out our agenda when God wants us to be willing to be interrupted. And I don't think a day goes by 
when I don't get interrupted in some way, I have, I have to make lists of the things that I have to do. And I, I present the list to the Lord in prayer in the morning, and I say, Lord, this is what I think you want me to do today. But I'm at your orders. I give myself to you, Lord. You arrange my day. And if some big interruption comes, which cancels out two so-called important things, that I can offer best to God, because I can say, Lord, this wasn't my idea, this was your idea, and so I thank you for it, and I offer it to you. And I want always to be available, no matter what happens. I mean, even if Lars's lunch has to be an hour late, Lars would agree with me. I mean, he, he's not a stickler for it, if, if I have it five or ten minutes late, some, once in a while. He, never would he complain about that. How do we bring together a life of sacrifice for the benefit of others and a quiet spirit in accepting whatever comes and an ordered day? It seems to me all those three things ought to fit very nicely together. Shouldn't be any problem, except that we're selfish. You know, we still want things to go our way, and God, because he is sanctifying us, wants us to have things his way. I agree with your comments about self-esteem. Oh, I guess I'm mixing up my piles here. Take one from each pile. Oh, I'm sorry. I wasn't even paying attention. What, what do you feel about church leaders who have the mindset that it's, quote, not enough, unquote, to have a ministry in your home, but you need to seek out other ministries at church? Well, since the question is couched in these terms, what do you feel about church leaders? Uh, Elizabeth Elliot's feelings are really not very important, are they? But I do think that church leaders often give the idea that everybody in the church is supposed to have what they call a ministry outside the home. They forget that ministry does not mean anything more or less than service. No higher ministry could be given to a mother than mothering. These little children are your mission field. This is your ministry. Somebody asked my mother uh, what she did outside of the home. And my mother had six children. And she looked bewildered. She said, well, nothing at all. <laughs> and this person then looked at me with pity and said, well, then your mother never had any life of her own, did she? My mother didn't know what she was talking about. My mother could not imagine what she meant by that. We were her life. She wasn't looking for anything else. And I can't imagine any greater gift that God could have given me than my one and only daughter. She was 10 months old when her father died, so I never had any more children because I didn't marry until I was in my 40s the second time. But it is a mistake, I think, for people to overlook the fact that ministry does not necessarily mean teaching a Bible class or running the church nursery or washing the dishes after the church supper. Of course those are ministries, but they're not the only ones. And there is no more important ministry than that of parenting. Mothers and fathers have the highest, holiest calling when God gives you children. And I don't mean by that that if you're single that you don't have as high a calling. Your singleness is a high calling. But you are freed by being single to do things that married people can't do. Ask God to show you what your specific ministry is. Question arising from video. Would you please explain again how my failures or sins can be a gift I can give to the Lord? I'm not sure I use the word gift, but I certainly would use the word give. My sins and my failures, I give them. I give up myself. And I give all that needs to be cleansed by the blood of Jesus into the hands of Jesus. And then he deals with it. And it's gone. He casts our sins into the depths of the sea, and they are remembered no more. And Corey Ten Boom pointed out that he puts up a sign that says, no fishing. Would you comment on our need to show grace to one another? Oh my, that's another whole seminar, isn't it? Our treatment of other people will indicate the measure of grace that we have been willing to receive from God. 
all of us are meant to be gracious. And you're not looking at a woman who is naturally gracious. God has to work on all of us, doesn't he? Grace, grace, God's grace, grace that will pardon and cleanse within. It's one of the old songs we used to sing in our family prayers. And I pray for grace, grace to do what God wants me to do. I pray you've been encouraged and inspired by what you've heard today. And will keep joining us here and on social media for my granny's inspiration. Until then, remember, the eternal God is your refuge and underneath are the everlasting arms. Thank you.